Hello, I'm John Wayland. I'm here to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, before I do that, I want to reach out and, uh, and say thank you to everybody for welcoming me and my team to this meeting. Uh, it's not very often in our careers that we're at the right place in the right time, and I'm delighted to be part of this. So buckle up. Our, our speaker is someone I've worked with and my teams have worked with for years. Um, he's a great friend and has made a lot more millionaires out of people than, than, than he hasn't. Uh, when I called him, I said, Mike, do you mind coming? Here's the date. And he said, uh, well, it's my wife's birthday. Well, Monica, his wife, is a contributor on CNN. So when, after you hear him speak, you'll, he'll probably talk about Monica. So when you see her on television, you'll be able to look at her and say, you know what? He'd rather speak to us than you that day. And I know that's not true, but uh, I, without any further things to say, Mike Lindstrom is, a, is a, an attorney by trade and was one of the first people to partner with Tony Robbins to work with Tony and his team. And that's where he really built his practice, went on on his own, and specialized in helping people achieve their dreams. And I've watched him help people not only personally and professionally, but he's made a big difference in people's lives. I'm delighted to have my friend, and I know you'll get something from him too, is Mike Lindstrom. We got time. Okay, wait, okay. Right. Thank you, thank you. Wow. Standing ovation, I haven't even said anything yet. Wow, that's great. It's awesome. You guys are great. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to John for the introduction. Uh, dear friend, I'm not just a colleague. Um, and we're very intimate with each other about all, all of our personal stuff. You'll hear a couple stories that come from me today, and John and I share that together. So I appreciate the introduction. I also want to say thank you to the team uh, for letting me come in today. I, I consider a company a family. And, you know, I really got the sense of that, Chico, last night, talking to you last night. And I, and I had heard about it. You're kind of a legend. I mean, you know this, right? And, and you all know this. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to brag on this guy for a little bit uh, and what, the, what this company really represents. And, and, not, and I agree, he's not a figure. He's part of the culture. He's what's, you know, built this organization from uh, Mr. Stone. So I work for Tony Robbins. Now, some of you, by the show of hands, do people know who Tony Robbins is? Okay. He just came out with a book. He's been around forever. Tony's in his mid-50s, okay? So Tony was mentored by a gentleman by the name of Jim Rohn, R-O-H-N. Uh, not Jim Rohn, the sports guy. He's a little young for that. <laughs> uh, and Tony was obsessed with learning about the science of success, how people do what they do. And he learned this from Jim Rohn. Well, Jim and all the, the forefathers, if you will, of personal development go all the way back to the beginning of the century. And Mr. Stone was part of that. And, and, I, and, I, and some people, I was talking to some of you last night, and you're like, yeah, I heard his name, and we talk about it, and it's, it's part of our culture. And I said, no, no, you don't understand. This is not an insurance thing, right? This is the world thing. A guy who has 100 bucks and goes out and starts a company, lives to be 100, who has this thing called PMA. You know how many people in my industry, they, they come up to me and go, oh, yeah, PMA, PMA. Oh, I said, well, judge by results, my friend. Guy lived to be 100 years old. He, he didn't just build a company, okay? He built a culture, and he built something that influences millions of people around the world. Think and Grow Rich is one of the best-selling books. I don't think it's next to the Bible. Chico could correct me, but in terms of personal development, it's right there. And I'm not trying to be religious here, but if you don't know that book, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, go read it. Okay, this stuff wasn't invented by Napoleon Hill. He was just smart enough to figure out Hey, there's a bunch of guys like Mr. Stone. I mean, you can go around all the millionaires that were making things happen in the beginning of the century, even after the Depression, right? Because they all were doing certain things the same way. And they didn't even realize it. They all had a great attitude. They surrounded themselves with good people, right? You are who you hang around. They wrote down their goals. You hear that all the time. Oh, it's so cliche. You got to write your goals down. No, no, you have to write your goals down. If you don't have your goals written down, they're not going to happen. Those are, I, I love it when people point to their head. Oh, I got goals right up here. Those are called dreams. Those are thoughts. You talk to yourself at 1,200 words a minute. Just listen to yourself right now. 
What time is my flight? When's he done? How many slides are in his PowerPoint? And there's only seven, by the way, just so you know. I'm not going through it. I'm not a deck guy, but I know some of you are visual, so I got to give it to you. That's how you learn. I get it. 1,200 words a minute. Do you realize that most people's self-talk is not positive? Do you know this, right? And you're worried about things. I, hell, I got two kids. I'm worried about my kids. Oh, are they safe? Are they okay? How, is my flight going to leave on time? Right? All these things that are in our brain, usually not positive. We are conditioned that way to protect ourselves. It's human instinct. So when you wake up, the first thought is usually not positive. Oh, 5.50, golly. What do I got going on today? How many meetings do I have? Oh, I can't get the kids. Oh, I hear crying in the background. Whatever. Condition yourself to think different. And what Chico said is so true. To be able to listen to a guy like that, to be a nexus. It, it, I mean this for my friend. It's an honor to listen to you talk today. Because I get it. that You are a nexus for something I did not know, but I knew a lot about. And to be able to be kind of the next generation. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'm 42. I'm no problem telling you my age. I am the next generation that helps carry that torch to someone like my two sons, Colton and Rhett, who are six and three, because they're learning that stuff in my home today. And that stuff came from a gentleman who you consider a mentor and a friend. So I want to say thank you so much for letting me come in today and, and talk about this stuff, because it's so important. All right. Uh, so the presentation, you see communication, next level thinking. You guys probably have heard this before, next level thinking. What is the next level? By the way, I need to get my uh, clicker here real quick. So uh, next level, it's, it's how you define it. Now I want you to write down three numbers real quick. This could be on your takeaway card if you want or if you want to write in your notes. 50, 40, 10. 50, 40, 10. Some of you may have seen this before. There was a study done about two years ago and it studied levels of happiness around the world. Now this ties directly into PMA. 50% of your ability to be happy, 50 that's half, is genetic. Isn't that crazy? Some of you, some of us in the world, we, like we're gifted the gene of not being happy. It's our propensity to be negative or positive. 50%. It's called your genetic set point. Genetic set point. 40% of your ability to be happy is personal choice. Personal choice. It's your outlook on life. It's the people you choose to hang around. It's the things that you interact with. It's your focus every day when you wake up. When you wake up, like I said, most people are stressed out. They're thinking about their day. When you wake up, start conditioning your mind to think about what's great. What am I grateful for? Asking yourself better questions. That's something that I definitely took away from Mr. Robbins. He would beat you up because I worked for this guy. I was an employee of this guy. He said, like, that's not the right question. That's not the right question. Ask a better question. Ask a better question. So I got conditioned when everything, anything was negative or something would happen or there's a problem or I lost a deal, I would always ask myself, what's great about this? What's great about this? What's great about this? I mean, I say that to myself all day long, even today. What's great about this? What's great about this? Right? 40% is your ability to choose what you want to do. Outlook on life. 10% is what we call your life environment. Think of it like your overall circumstance, where you live, family, education, plays into that. Now, I was speaking up in uh, Minneapolis uh, last year in the insurance industry, and a gentleman came up to me and he goes, hey, that whole 10% thing, he goes, this, is, this is a really big deal up here in Minnesota. He goes, you know, we don't get day, you know, daylight, it's cold, so the, the environment literally affects us. So we can go to the doctor and they have these lamps. They're called happy lamps. Have you heard of Who's heard of these things? Anybody ever used one? I never have. I live in Scottsdale, by the way, so we, I, I live in a happy lamp, right? Every day I wake up, sun, boom. Except when it's July and it's 117 degrees out. Happy lamps. So they're trying to change the 10% because they understand that the environment can influence that. The snow, the weather. I have a buddy of mine. Uh, he's uh, actually went on the board of uh, UBA, uh, Broker Association, up in Anchorage, Alaska. And he was telling me that a couple weeks ago, they had a, a it's called um, Suicide Prevention Week or Awareness Week. I said, oh, is that normal? I've never really heard of that. I mean, I heard of that on television, but that's not local in Arizona where I'm from. He goes, yeah, it's a big deal out here. We have really high percentages of suicide rates during certain times of the year, especially in the wintertime. 
because they have small days, right? And the, and, the, and the other time of the year, it's, it's sunny all the time. I mean, it's because of where they are in the latitude in, in the, on the planet. Never would have thought about this, but it ties back into. Does anybody know, can anybody guess, the happiest countries on the planet that they studied? Take, take a wild guess. What would you say? And it's not the U.S., by the way. Yeah, Denmark, Sweden, Norway. Three different countries, three different cultures. I know, I lived in Copenhagen, Denmark for six months when I studied in college, studying international politics. So communal and so familial. Every Friday, we would go down to the community center. We would, we would trade off certain days of the week where we would, the families would cook for each other. I mean, can you imagine? Some people don't even know their next door neighbors in this country. Okay, the most depressed country, if you will. What's a guess, what's a guess on that? Japan. Japan. They actually have a word for it. I can't remember the name of it. They, it's in the study. I mean, have you ever, have you ever seen those TV sh like shows or you watch documentaries or you see the YouTube videos? Like them getting on a, uh, the Japanese people getting on a subway? You think New York's bad? Oh, they, they, that's, you got plenty of space in a New York subway. In Japan, whew, it's five times. I mean, they're literally crunched up against each other. The average square footage that they live in, you think you have a small house? Because you only have 1,700 square feet? Oh my goodness. They'd be pumped to have like these 500 square foot pods that are in high rise buildings. Now imagine that's your life every day. How does that not affect your emotional state, right? Outlook on life. Now, in my business, I always think about the 40% because I can't influence the 10 too much. I can get you to maybe get, get, get a marriage, you know, or a move or get an education, but that's not where I focus on. The 50, I got no chance because that's genetic. That's you. That's mom and dad. <laughs> it's the 40. And that's what I'm here today to talk about. The 40% that you choose to focus on every single day. And I agree. And the, the loudest word that Chico said when he spoke, I heard his whole speech. He said, action. That was the loudest word that came out of his mouth because he's right. You're going to invest time and money, which are the two most valuable assets we have, to be here for a few days, be away from your families, which are the most important people in your life, and you're going to walk away from here, and you're not going to take action on it. And, that, and that, that's, that's a bummer to me, when that, when that, whenever it happens. So there's three things I want you to think about. You can write these down. This is a Mike Lindstrom thing. TM, uh, TMI. Now, some of you go, TMI, that's like too much information. No, it's not. Touch, touch. Move, impact. That's what sales is all about. That's it. This is a relationship game. He said it. It's not just knowing the script and knowing the product. I have some of my top sales folks. They're not very good about product. They don't even know their contracts. But you know what they're amazing at? Touching people, moving people, and impacting people in some way. They have information about people. And that's powerful. So that's my hope in a brief 40 minutes is I can touch you, move you, or impact you in some way. And if you get one idea from what I'm going to share with you today, then and you go out and take what Chico said, you take action on it, then it's time well spent. How many people would agree with that? Show of hands. Okay, great. All right. So definition of change. You have to take a look at the definition. You can read it yourself. Think about where you want to go because you do studies on this. You, when you ask people, are you there yet? Have you arrived? Are you totally happy? Most people will tell you no. There's another level. So they, put, they always put their hand up. I want to go here. I want to go to, to Lisbon next year. I want to make this much money. Well, where are you at? They go, oh, I'm about here. There's a gap. You see that gap? So you want to change. So you have to, what I say, mind the gap. So when you think about what that gap is, there's a behavior or a belief change that has to happen in order to get to that level. But before you do this, you have to look at where you're at. One of my favorite books, uh, Good to Great by Jim Collins, if you haven't read it. Good to Great. Jim Collins, much like Napoleon Hill, by the way, interviewed a bunch of great leaders and great companies. And he figured out that there are great companies and good companies that exist in the same space. So like a, a B of A versus a Wells Fargo, a CVS versus a Walgreens. So he studied these. He had all his uh, grad students go back and look at years and years of numbers, revenue, EBITDA, everything, to figure out where there was a jump off point where one company just took off and the other one kind of stayed the same. So I don't want to get into the math, but you can read the book. 
He, he interviewed all the leaders of these great companies, not the good ones, the great ones. And they had all something in common, just like Napoleon Hill found back in, you know, back in the turn of the century. The great leaders of companies, the great companies, they were always willing to, this is a term out of his book, confront the brutal facts. Confront the brutal facts of your situation. They were never happy. They were always worried about the competition. They wanted more. There was always another level. They were looking it up here and examining where they are here and figuring out how to close the gap, right? So when you think about what's that next level for you in your life, you got to be brutally honest with yourself. I mean, results are, are, are usually pretty specific. Now, in our country, we struggle with uh, health. Well, let me break it out even more simple. There's two things that we struggle with the most in this country. Our self and money. Every one of us, me too. Our self and money. You know what self is? Self-confidence, self-esteem, body image. Oh, we got major, that's a big one in our country. Who, who in here, because I always like to do this for selfish reasons, it's a study. Does anybody in here get out of the, get out of the shower, totally naked, and look in the mirror and go, I'm perfect. <laughs> Show of hands? It's usually a guy. Chico, I thought, you, I, I thought you might. I thought it might be Chico. I thought it might be Chico. <laughs> oh, I gotta try, I gotta try this. One, two, three. That's for you, buddy. I love that, I love that. No one does that. You don't get out of the, I, I, I was doing fitness trainers in uh, California, speaking to them. Big group, of, I mean, they're all ripped. Like, average room, average body fat in the room is like 5%, 10%, whatever. So I asked the same question I just asked you. And there was, no hands went up, by the way. No hands went up. These were like sculptures of people. No one raised their hand. And they're nudging this guy in the back. This African-American guy looks like Billy Blanks from Tybo. Remember Billy Blanks? He looks just like him. Shaved head. I mean, he, and then he opens his voice. He's a big guy, about six foot three, about 225. And he's got this, like, Michael Jackson voice, which didn't fit. I'm like, okay. He goes, oh, I, uh, I don't know. I get out of there. I, I, I just, there's just a little spot right here. I can't get rid of it. I go, buddy, what's your body fat? He's like, four and a half percent. I said, so you, get out, you don't get out and look at yourself and post down. He does shows and stuff. He doesn't even see perfection. It's almost, this guy could be a model in any magazine, but he still sees one thing, this little tiny spot. We're all no different. You get a bunch of great emails, and then you get one email that's not good. Which one do you open first? The bad one. I remember the first time I ever did Fox National was when the, the last election it was 2008. And I'm live. I'm in New York. I'm in the studio. And I'm going to talk about image, how the presidents were like showing up on TV and stuff. Not talking politics. And that was not why I was there. Very clear with the producers, the writers, and I'm on a panel of five. And I remember thinking, oh, gosh, if this guy, David Osman, if he throws me a political question, I just got to be prepared because this guy's a wild. He, he, does, he goes off script. So sure enough, I'm there to talk about the image of the presidents, McCain, Obama, every, how they speak, like on a microphone. He's like, I don't know, Mike, uh, live, we're live, okay, Fox National, you have three million viewers. I don't know, Mike, I mean, what do you think? Don't you think this campaign is going to really come down to, like, the issue of abortion, don't you think? And I'm sitting there in my brain going, what the hell did he just ask me? I'm here to talk about image. I'm not, I got clients that are on both sides. I don't want to get political here, right? I'm trying to get the politically correct, correct answer. And I skirted the question. I know how to reframe. I say, you know, Dave, it's not really about the issues. Because the truth is, Americans don't really know the issues. It's about how they show up. So I was able to redirect it. You know, I've been media trained. I know how to do it. And then he hits me with another political question. It's, by the way, it's on my YouTube channel. You watch my face for two, the two seconds. If you do Mike Lindstrom, Fox National, there's that moment. But in my head, I talk to myself a thousand words a minute like anybody. I'm doing that holy crap moment. And I'm walking off the set in five minutes and it just happened. And I didn't do badly, but in my head, I thought I did. So I'm walking off the set and I started checking my phone. I'm calling my wife. Hey, how'd I do? Was I sweating on my bald head? I mean, he asked me two questions I wasn't supposed to talk about. And then I get all, this flood of all these great emails. Mike, you did great. Text message, you did awesome. And then I get one guy who I don't even know sends me a, 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 it a Facebook post or something. Of all the things that I looked at were positive, 
I looked right to the negative one and I read it. And he was like, I can't believe you took a stance on this and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, buddy, I don't even know you. But it affected me. Because you know why? This is what we do as human beings. We want to look good, we want to be right, and we want to survive. Right? If I made you guys all stand up and do introductions right now, that's exactly what you would do. You'd want to look good, you want to be right, you just want to be an idiot in front of your peers, and you want to just survive the moment. You just want to get the attention off of you to go to the next person. Your clients are no different. This is how we show up in sales meetings. Right? Look good, be right, survive. We struggle with ourself and we struggle with money every single day. So when you think about change, there's always something that you want to change. So you got to think about for yourself. Now, we don't have time today to go through it. I love going around the room. That's one of my favorites. I'm an interactive guy. To ask you, what is the one thing that you really want to change about yourself? Take it to the next level. Whatever it is. Hey, you want to lose weight. You want to, be a better, uh, you want to feel better in your skin. I mean, most people, you know this. A healthy person shows up. In a, in a healthy way, right? We say mind and body are one. If your mind is clean, your body is clean, your, and it's vice versa. So that's my hope. When you go back and think about the, the trip, I mean, you guys are spending enormous amounts of money to invest in you guys. And, and he's right. Your biggest asset is you guys. You are the equity. The relationships you have are the equity of this company. And the more that you think about how you want to take it to that next level, you're going to start to see how it's going to affect not just the company, but yourself. So here's a couple stats if you want to jot these down real quick. And I have no problem. I'll, I'll tell the guys I would email this to you guys if you want to. And I'll, I'll give you my information at the end. It's got my email, Twitter, LinkedIn, all that stuff. I'm, uh, I, like, I love sharing this stuff. So I'm not going to read all these, but the, I talked about 1,000 words a minute. We talked to ourselves. But bits of information, I always think about that. And a will to a meaning in life. There's a, a book, one of my favorite books, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl survived the Holocaust. He was a medical doctor. And he tells you the story in the first half of the book, what really happens. And then he tells you, this, he, he literally developed that term, logotherapy, which is the meaning. And, and Chico talked about this, the meaning. We're always searching for meaning. What's that mean? What's that mean? What's that mean? One of my favorite things I learned when I was 26 years old, nothing in life means anything except for the meaning you give it. That's a choice. That's 40%. You have a choice. Nothing in life means anything. You lost a deal. So what? Somebody passed away. So what? Do you think the universe cares? Do you think that asteroid that's going around the planet that may hit the planet again one day cares that, that somebody passed away in your family? Probably not. Do you think your neighbors two down that didn't even know your family cares? They're going through grief? Probably not. The, your colleagues that you compete with, that you lost a deal? It's a choice. Nothing in life means anything except for the meaning you give it. And I always think about that. But in the book, he talks about this. He talks about the people who survived are the people that were, uh, they were strong in their meaning. Now, I interpreted the book to be like your why. That's, that's a term I use a lot, your why. Why do you want to live? That's why the Gestapo, uh, the Germans, they would strip you of all personal goods, pictures, jewelry, anything that gave you a meaning to hold on to. They took it all away because they knew the power of it. And Viktor Frankl talks about this in the book. He talks about the meaning that we give things. The fact that we, that we live life every day searching for that. And I don't mean the big question, right? What's the meaning of life? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about everyday interactions. I teach this to my clients. I have, any, my clients know this. My coaching clients, they, they call me up on our call or Skype. Hey, Mike, you know that big deal I was working on? Oh, man, we were on the one yard line. I thought, I thought I was gonna punch it in, lost it. First question out of my mouth to my client, what's that mean? And I expect the answer to be nothing. And the next question is, what's the meaning you're going to give it? Because you have a choice, 40%. What's the meaning you're going to give it? I'm like, well, that's a good question. I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> and I've been thinking about it. The meaning I'm going to give it is, that's called conscious choice. Conscious choice. You read the Dalai Lama talks about this, being present with people and being aware but being on purpose, a why, why are you doing that? I would love to be, you know, one of your coaches that follows you around every day if I had the ability to and go into a meeting with you and do calls with you and come out of a meeting and go, why'd you ask that? Why'd you ask that? Why did you say that? Why'd you show that? Because I want you to condition yourself to think about, well, why did I ask that question? Why did I do that? Why did I choose 40% to do that? It's a choice that we make. 
I'll give you a little, a little tip that I, I learned this from one of my mentors. How many people in here, be honest, you wake up, like first thing in the morning, five minutes, you're like waking up, you're coming to, and start checking your cell phone or check like a laptop or check the news, raise your hand. It's usually about half, by the way, it's, or more, it's about half. Um, why do you do that? Why do you choose, 40%, to do that? Why? Somebody tell me. You looking for some good news in there? No, seriously. Okay, here, how about this? How many people watch the news in the morning? Raise your hand. Why do you do that? Craig, Craig, why do you check the news? Why? Okay, but why? What's, the, what, what's behind all of it? What do you, what, what, you, so you're informed, so what? Knowledge is power. Are you looking for good news? But you choose to watch it. That makes no sense to me. You check your email in the morning? How many people are emailing you every week? Man, you're doing a great job, Craig. You're awesome. Hey, man, thanks for being badass. How many of those do you get a day? Uh, not yet. <laughs> not even yet. No, no, I'm serious. I want to challenge you guys. I don't watch the news in the morning. You know what I watch with my kids? Cartoons. They make me laugh. And I love laughter in my home. That's a choice. I used to be the guy who watched news because I wanted to be informed. I wanted to see what the stock market was doing. I wanted to see what was going on. Let me tell, I'm going to tell you a true story. Yesterday, I fly all the time. I actually, for people on LinkedIn, I'm on social media a lot. I put myself out there. I put us on Twitter yesterday. So I flew from Phoenix, Arizona to O'Hare. I, I've been here three times in the last month, by the way. Fine. I sleep for five minutes, ten minutes on the ascent, pull out my journal, I, I get the internet, I mean, start you know, doing my stuff. No big deal. It's like a routine. I was sitting there in the airport in Phoenix, Arizona, and I saw that plane crash on that video yesterday. Did anybody see that? Raise your hand. In Asia? It's, it's scary. It's sad. But I saw it. It went into my consciousness. Got on the plane. We're on the ascent. Had a little bit of turbulence. No big deal. For three and a half hours, I couldn't, I couldn't shake it. I couldn't shake it. I was nervous. I mean, the guy next to me, I was on the aisle. Poor gentleman in the middle. He probably thought I was on meth. <laughs> I mean, I'm just jittery. I couldn't sit still. And every time something would bump. That never happens. Call it anxiety, call it what you want. But the fact is, the, the fact that I chose to watch that TV screen, and I didn't mean to, it just happened to come into my brain. It affected me for three and a half hours. I was telling John Whalen about this. That never happens. That's the power of looking at something, being around something, thinking about something, PMA, right? And putting it into your brain. Whatever you bring into your consciousness. That, that's such an important thing. Whatever you bring into your consciousness. That's a choice. So the things you read, the, the people you hang around, there was that study done about three years ago. It said, I don't know how they figured this out, but um, the five people that you spend the most time with in your life, wife, husband, kids, partners, colleagues, boss, whatever, just figure it out, put it on a pie graph. You could do this for yourself. In terms of your character, you're the mean, right in the middle, of the five that you hang around. Okay, the study kind of was provocative when it came out. People were like, how did they figure that out? And I, I did the same thing. I'm like, wait, who do I hang out the most? My wife, my two kids, my business partner. I'm going through my brain, figuring it out. In a given seven days, who do I literally spend the most time with? And I started going through it. I'm like, yeah, that's about right. I'm about the middle of that five people. You know, and it, it's good. I mean, I like to surround myself with good people. I heard that a long time ago. I learned that from Napoleon Hill. Sitting around with people and doing mastermind groups. I learned that from him. He wrote that book in the 20s. He had to figure it out. Mr. Stone figured it out. We have choice. So there's people in your, in your group, friends or family. Here, here's, the, here's the challenge. Challenge yourself to think about them in a different way. Be curious about them or choose not to hang around them as much. There's people that bring you down. But when you choose things in your life, just like when you wake up, just like when you wake up. Now, what I do is for 10 minutes, 
I, I hit the snooze button on my phone. I use vibrate on my phone everywhere I go. I don't like, I don't like phone tones. I just don't like the rings. So it's always on vibrate. So it goes off and it automatically snoozes once or twice. For 10 minutes when it goes off in the morning, my choice is I start asking myself a bunch of questions. What's great about today? What am I excited about? Who do I get to be around today? Not who I have to be around, right? It's choice. 10 minutes as you're coming to. And you start thinking about that. You get what you focus on. That's not most people. Most people don't wake up and think about what's, what they're grateful for. And then some people, it's prayer. Some people, it's, um, I had a gentleman last week. He said, you know what I do, Mike? I do um, meditation I, to clear my head. You know, I've had bad dreams. I had a rough night. I got a, a, a long day. I just like to meditate for five minutes, whatever that means to him. Meditation is different for everybody. You guys know that. So conscious choice, but it's what you bring into your consciousness, and it starts right when you wake up. And by the way, it's, it, it ends when you go to bed. I know this because I used to watch crime shows like A&E and Discovery, and I, I, I'm a, I have a tendency to fall asleep on the couch just with a remote because I like to watch TV late at night, History Channel, whatever. And I would go up to my room, go to bed, be with my wife, and I would have these crazy dreams. And I'm like, why am I having all these bad dreams? But I understand how the brain works. I'm like, Mike, it's simple, buddy. You're watching all these crap shows. You know, murder, investigate. And you had this thing in your head and your brain, you're feeding it. So I quit watching this. I watch them now usually in the daytime because I don't want to go to bed thinking about those negative thoughts. It's what you fill your mind with. Guys, do you know where this all comes from? PMA. The, I'm not a, I, I am in this business because of a gentleman like Mr. Stone. Seriously. That's not just a compliment to your culture and your company. Because they figured it out. They actually did it, and you know what? They took action on it. It wasn't just a thought. I don't want to come in here and sunburn you. Sunburn is where I come in and get you fired up about a thought, a change, getting something to think different, waking up early, setting your alarm, whatever you get out of today. And then a week later, you're a, you're a tan. You're not sunburned anymore. Three weeks later, what happens when you get really sunburned? What happens? Yeah, you peel off. And then you're back to your old self. This is what happens in January. Everyone's all, who, who set New Year's resolutions? Raise your hand. What was your resolution? Calling you out. What's that? It was a weight loss goal? 80% of Americans that have resolutions set weight loss goals. 80%. That's the number one, by the way. And, and you know what? There's a lot of people in this room that share the same story. That was January 1. Now, this year, the 5th is when everybody started because that was a Monday because people had the weekend off. The third Monday of January is called the most depressing day of the year. It's called, it's called Blue Monday. It's a thing. I don't, I don't know if I believe in it, but I understand it. Okay, it's cold, shorter days, not much light out. Credit debt's coming in for the average American who's spending credit card debts. You, you can see the numbers. The economy shows it. They got their bill January 15th because they overspent. So they have this equation. They put all these elements together, and they go, that makes sense. Third Monday. Monday. Everybody hates Monday. At least in this country, they do. Some countries actually love Monday because it's the beginning of something new. But for us in our country, it, it's a hangover. It's, oh, gosh, it's five whole days to Friday. That's a choice. Okay? All right. So these are a couple things I want to give you. These are more like takeaways. Um, how we make decisions, process information, the meaning we give that. We talked about that already. The meaning that you give things. You've got to be conscious of where, again, we're talking to ourselves all the time. So what are you telling yourself, right? Communication is what binds us all. Now, this is, my, the, this is the sales training, if you will. That's the beauty of sales training. The best training tool I teach when I do sales training, pure sales training, is this. A journal. I call it a capture mechanism. It's not a diary. Dear Mike, today sucked. <laughs> I had a rough day. That's not what it is. If you diary, that's fine. I'm not making fun of it. But a lot of people, when I hold this up and I talk about journaling, journaling is not sitting down with your everyday uh, thoughts. It's part of it. Imagine when you walk into a meeting. You're all, you're all in sales in some way, shape, or form. I know you have different roles. I get that. But you walk into a conference room with a prospect. And you open up the journal with a blank page, date the page, put their name on the top of it. You've already sent a message before you even open your mouth. Hey, what you say is important. 
and I want to make sure I get it. And then after a half hour, hour, you fill up two full pages. No, I'm not sitting there not being present. Okay, there's, a, there's an art form to it. You don't sit there and go. No, it's a conversation. I write little tidbits. I do a lot of uh, little letters, acronyms. But at the end of a meeting, my goal is to have at least one page. I want to send you a subconscious message that I filled up a page on you. And I got some good information. I, I'm going to get into the deeper stuff without you even knowing it. You're going to talk about your wife real quick. And I'm going to go, oh, what's your wife's name? Marie. Wife's name is Marie. Oh, yeah, last week we took the kids down to Florida. Oh, how many kids you got? Two. Two kids. Because that information is what binds us. So the next time I touch that prospect or client, that's the first thing that comes out of my mouth. I go back to the previous touch, and I keep, a dot, I keep it in my Google, uh, oh, my notes. So if, if you're my pro, I know everything about you, and you don't even know it. I know where you vacation. I know what cigar you smoke. I know your drink. I know what language patterns you, cho you choose to use. And I've gathered that because I just ask questions. But it's the journal that helps me. I, I don't have the best memory. But I, I, want to, I want to send you a message that's important, but it's what I do with that information. I bring it right into my notes. So the next time I touch you, I'm relevant. People go, gosh, man, that Mike remembers everything. He remembers everything. John Whalen and I have a mutual friend. His name is Mike. His dad passed away when he was young. And I remember the first time I met Mike, he talked, I get very deep with my clients. You know, I want to find out what your past, what are you scared of, where would you get your character from, all that stuff. One of the first things he told me was the day his, pa his father passed away. It was just real in passing. Put it right in the calendar, recurring event. Every year on that date, I look at, I look at my calendar and I have, if, you look, if I put my calendar up here, you'd see recurring events everywhere. Birthdays, anniversaries, when somebody passed away. Every year, Mike, one of my dear friends, gets a text or a phone call from me. It, this is 10 year, 11 years now. He goes, you and my wife are the only people that know. It's going to mean so much to me that you remember the day that my father passed away, even though you never met him. It binds us. So look for that information. But if you don't have a capture mechanism, you know, how many, you know how much golden information you're getting in a meeting and you don't even realize it? Oh, yeah, you had a great weekend. Oh, you went to the Super Bowl. Oh, that's great. And you just go, oh, anyway, let's talk about my presentation. Let me go to my deck. Let me go to my PowerPoint. I love walking into a first meeting. I, do, I teach this to financial planners. They freak out because they're all high compliant people, detail orientation, numbers, right? I, I know behavioral. I'm, I'm certified in it. I know behavior. They are detailed perfectionists. And like, Mike, wait, wait, let me get this right. So I'm going to go into a, my first meeting to, to, to get this guy's half million bucks. I go, whoa, 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 back up. No, that's not what you're doing. That's what you think you're doing. You need to go in there and create a bind, a relationship. You haven't earned the right to ask for that guy's half a million bucks. You gotta go in there and pre-frame it. You go into that millionaire's office and you say, hey, you know what, John, I'll tell you what, I don't know what other financial planners do. I don't know what your current guy does, but you, you see this journal I got here. I, I'm a believer in understanding more about who you are as a person. So I've got a, a list of questions in my mind. It's just a conversation today. Uh, and my goal is to you know, get as much information as I can about you, what you value, what keeps you up at night, what are your goals, where do you see yourself in five years, 10 years? Tell me about your family. And, and then, and then only then, maybe I have earned the right to get another meeting with you. And then we can sit here and talk about insurance policies, financial planning, et cetera, et cetera. No one does that. That separates you immediately. You already have a great brand. They're, you're, some of your prospects, you're, you know, you're more of the, the, the elite folks in your industry, they know who your company has been around forever. Everyone knows the, the, the brand on the front, the logo combined, but the name on the back, that's your name. That's your jersey. That's your, that's your brand, right? So when you sit there and say, hey, my brand is to get to know who you are, and you go up and fill a full page of information, and you capture it. I teach my, uh, I teach my reps, the people who are in sales, I'm old school. I'm a note card guy. Back to the old school. Five by eights or three by fives, doesn't matter. Your goal is to identify your top 20 prospects or clients, either way or both, if you want to get aggressive with it, and you write their name on the top line of that, that note card. And then the next year, you have to fill up both sides. You have to know everything. And I, I, asked, my, I asked my guys, so hey, what's, what's the wife's name? Oh, I haven't got that yet. How do you not get that? How many kids does he have? I don't even know. 
And you call this a client? He's your friend? Just because you do a couple rounds of golf with the guy and he pays you money? Now, I'm going to challenge you guys. I'm serious. You have clients already. Go back. Lower your ego. And tell, tell your client, your current client, these aren't prospects. These are people that are, you already work with. There's already an agreement. The, communi the communication that binds you seems to be pretty tight because they pay you or they've paid. Do a, redo, do a redo. I call it reset. Go back and sit there and go, hey, Garrett, <laughs> we've been, I met you like four years ago. And you're a great partner, man. I really appreciate you. And I have to be honest. I went to this uh, seminar. I heard this crazy bald dude named Michael Instrument. I don't know if you heard the guy. But he was challenging us to think about our relationships. And I realized that there's a lot about you that I don't know. I don't know what keeps you up at night. I don't know where you see yourself in 10 years. I've never had you tell me what's on your bucket list, the things you want to do before you die. I would love to get to know that about you. Is that okay? I've never had anybody say no. When I do redos, and I do them, they never go, no, 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 that's, that's not cool. <laughs> Let's just keep it the way it is. Too much information, pal. They don't do that. Because everyone's favorite subject is what? Themselves. Get them to talk about themselves and get the communication that binds you. Now, rules of engagement, this is a, per again, I got this from Jim Collins. He talks about rules of engagement in his book, Good to Great. The great leaders always create rules of engagement for themselves. Now, this can be kind of a corporate term, by the way. You've probably heard this, leadership events. But you have to have rules of engagement for yourself. So, you want to lose weight this year? You have a weight goal. We don't need to talk about it. But you have it in your mind. So, you have to create rules of engagement. Not just say set the goal. You got to say, you know what? Okay, Monday through Friday, I'm not going to eat out. Because we all eat out, right? Different times. So, on the weekends, I'm going to let myself to, and I work with a lot of salespeople. So, extroverts, type A's, people like you. You know, they drink alcohol. Hey, I was at the party last night. I saw you guys getting busy around that track, man. That was fun. Those are my clients. So I see it in their plan. They go, like, I only want to drink like on Saturday or Sunday. Okay. That, that's your rule of engagement. They don't only want to do a certain amount of happy hours. They want to have X amount of meetings per week. You got to have your own rules of engagement to be wildly successful and get the things that you want. So I always say create your own personal manual. And then understanding the psychology of motivation is this. If you want to, and by the way, I'm totally cool with technology. If you guys take pictures of this stuff, I'm not offended. This is not proprietary, so to speak. So I always get people taking pictures of slides. It's fine. And, and again, I'll, I'll send this PowerPoint out to you. This is the, this is the, uh, uh, the psychology of action or in, in inaction, to Chico's point. Take action. It's either because you want it really bad or you're really afraid. Has anybody ever had this before where you're like sick and tired of being sick and tired? And you said, that's it, I'm changing. That's it, that number on that scale has got to go away. Right? Or a relationship. In business, too, by the way, not just a marriage or somebody you dated, right? In business, there's, there's clients that drive you crazy. And sometimes you have to fire a client. I've had to do it, not fun. But I chose. They were, they were sucking off me, negative energy, took away from me. They weren't in my five that I want to be around. So I made a choice and said, you know what, that's too much negativity. Most, if I put this on a 0 to 10 scale bar, you can see 0 to 10. This is like a horizontal line. The middle is comfort zone. That's CZ. America tends to live on the left side. That's why it's called the left side. Right? You wake up, you're worried, you're watching the news, you're feeding yourself all that negative stuff, you're worried about kids, stress, money, you're worried about yourself, and you're worried about money. And I, the most successful people I know I'll, I'll tell you a true story. Dave Lineker is the founder of Remax International. You guys all know Remax, right? Red and blue, the balloon. Dave's in his 70s. Now I've known Dave for probably 10 years. And he had this, he had me speak at their international conference for all their top salespeople. These aren't the agents. These are the ones that sell the brokerage, for, like the broker, the, the territories around the world. It's an international event. It's in Colorado where he lives. Dave has got a, I, I, I can't even call it a house. It's like a chateau. The 25,000 square feet, he's a car fanatic, he's a gun fanatic. I mean, this is public knowledge, everyone knows. Dave's out there, He'll, he puts himself in the public domain, so there's nothing private, I'm telling you. He hosted a party after the event, for all his top salespeople. And he's got this gun safe that's about the size of this whole stage, by the way. It's, it's a, literally a, a vault from a bank that he bought. It's probably about eight feet tall. 
and it's got a big wheel on it, so it locks in every night. And he's got he, he's got guns from uh, like Civil War all the way around. He's such a gun fanatic. The U.S. Army gave him a Gatling gun that no one has. It's in a casing. He's never shot it, and he loves talking about it. And it's it's not it's not braggadocia. He's just a fanatic. He loves talking to anybody about what he loves, cars. But he's such a passionate guy. He has this little moment where he's by himself, and we're friends. I go up to him and go, "Hey, Dave. <laughs> First of all." Thanks for having me in your house. And you and your wife, this is amazing. I mean, this, you got a whole restaurant downstairs. I mean, this is overwhelming. And I, and I had to ask in my business. I asked him, I go, Dave, when does it stop? You're a billionaire with a B. You have everything you want. When does it stop? He's sitting there with a scotch in his hand, and he goes, you know, Mike, it's what you said today. I heard you speak. It's the same thing that you just said. There's always another level. And he says, you know what I see? He puts it down. He goes, I see a pie graph in my head. And it's my competitors. And I know what my market share is in the United States and around the world. I want more. Coldwell Banker, Century 21. I want more. I hate, you can see, he's pat. You're like, wow, this guy's got everything in the world. Money and ourself. I don't think he's too worried about himself. But that other one, it triggers him. This is a guy who's got everything he wants. He wants more. He wants more. I've never met a billionaire or a millionaire or a CEO or someone who's a great leader who doesn't want more. Just go ask anybody. Michael Jordan always wants more. Tom Brady, they just interviewed him after the Super Bowl. Like the guy or not? Do you think he's going to retire next week? No. No. People say, no, you should hang it up. He's at the top of his game. You know what else, you know what else he wants? There's something missing on his hand. Anybody know? Another ring. That's how champions think. But they live over on the right side, right? Pleasure. What do you want, not what you don't want? I was literally doing a seminar uh, a couple years ago. And uh, this gal had, you know, at the end I'll do Q&A. And this gal uh, was interacting with me, asking me questions. So I asked her point blank. I says, what is it that you really want? Like in your career, what do you really want? And she goes, well, I just don't want to be in a position where I feel like I'm doing a nine to five. I'm not passionate. I'm just an employee for somebody else. I'm not doing what I want to do. And I said, whoa, whoa, time out. You just told me what you don't want. I didn't ask you that. Tell me what you want. She continues to tell me again, even through prompting, what she doesn't want. Hardwired. She automatically focuses on what she doesn't want. She's not focused on what she wants. She's living on the left side. That's called scarcity. When you wake up and you're scarce, whatever you resist will persist. <laughs> right? If you keep focusing on the left side, you're just going to keep getting it. If you're afraid of something, you're just going to feed it. So we have to get to the right side. This is such a perfect uh, tie-in with what you guys have in your culture, PMA. That's on the right side. All right. Something at stake. One of my mentors, uh, Dan Lear, taught me this years ago. When you have something at stake, you have a higher probability of success. Any, any golfers in here? Anybody golf? Yeah? So imagine we're golfing, me and you. And we're just having fun. And we're on the 18th hole. You got about a six-foot putt, and you're lining it up. And I said, I'll bet you $1,000 you can't make it. You're like, whoa, oh, so there's something at stake. 1000 bucks? That changes the game. Anytime you bet somebody, you hold yourself accountable. If you want to truly change, just stand up here tonight or tomorrow or your peer group or in your office and stand up and tell everybody what you're going to do. You know what? I declare from now on, I'm not going to be a smoker. I am going to lose weight. I know I eat Chipotle five times a week. If you guys catch me eating Chipotle, call me out. Public accountability. Powerful. I saw a guy quit smoking in one of my rooms in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. At the end of the meeting, he asked me he wanted help to quit smoking. I said, it's real simple. Get up and tell everybody you want to quit smoking, number one. But number two, have something that's bigger at stake. I said, you got, you got kids? I, said, I got two daughters. I said, great. So we're going to take a break. I want you to call your uh, 13 and 11 year old daughter on the phone and I want you to tell them on the phone today that daddy's proud of himself because today he declared, he chose 40% that he's going to be a non-smoker here forward and that if he ever goes back, if they ever see him put another cigarette in his mouth, it means that daddy doesn't love you. You should have saw the fear in his eye. He goes, I go, I already know. I know what's going on in your brain already. I get it. This is what I'm trained to do. You're stuck. 
because that you know you want it, and, but you can't make that call because there's nothing at stake. And if you make that claim, you're never going to go back. He looked, I thought he was going to come across the table at me. He looked like kind of pissed off, right? And he goes, all right, I'm going to do it. 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 He gets all fired up, right? He goes in the break. Three of the gals who were his colleagues or smokers too, they went over to the area outside of the break area, and he made the phone call. He came back in the room. I didn't even know what was going on in the back of the room as I was getting everybody back together. It looked like kumbaya out there. They're all hugging and crying. And I said, buddy, is there, is there something you want to share? He goes, I just made that phone call. I literally just called my daughters and I got phone. And I'm so emotional right now because I realized this is what's going to be for me as a dad. I want to live to see my daughters go down that aisle. I want to be around for a long time because I realized today, just today, and I'm embarrassed to admit this, that there's something bigger. There's a purpose. People are watching me. My daughters are watching me. I called, the, I called the manager that brought me in uh, a month later. Uh, I said, hey, how's, uh, how's Craig doing, by the way, with the smoking? He's like, dude, he's never touched a cigarette since then. I don't know what kind of Jedi stuff you did on him in that meeting, but he quit. Well, I understand that. Purpose is the fuel to action. They did a study of people who committed suicide, tried to commit suicide, and lived. And they asked him, why'd you do it? Guess what the answer was? Why, why would somebody do that? There's no reason to be here anymore. No family, no money, no job, no purpose. I don't, I don't have a purpose here. So it sounds kind of harsh, but if you don't have a purpose in your business or life, why are you taking up all our oxygen? Think about that. It's a powerful statement. So when you think about that for yourself, now I'm not, this is not an easy thing to solve. I get that. But I want to challenge you to work to that. That's what the gentleman wrote in, in that book, The Man's Search for Meaning. What's your purpose? Why are you here? Not because it's a J-O-B. You know what J-O-B stands for, right? Just over broke? It's not a job. This is what you get to do. Not what I have to do. It's what I get to do. All right. So I'm going to leave you with this. Two and a half seconds every single day. Now, I've, I got this. You can write this down. I got this from a sales guy at Guardian Life Insurance. He gave me the right to tell this story. So. At Guardian Life Insurance, you, you have your big trip. How, what percentage of people get to go on that trip? So the top 15%. Okay, so Matt. Okay, okay. Well, I heard your comment they're going to get that extra hotel, right, at the other resort. Correct. But what, I, what I'm asking in reality is what percentage usually gets there, right? 15 to 20% or whatever. Same thing at Guardian Life Insurance. They have what's called Top Gun. And it's top 23. It's, what, it's based off percentage. It's not the top 20. That year was 23. One of my guys who's been in the business 18 years, he's in your industry, insurance industry, uh, out of Pittsburgh. And he says, uh, this year, man, I'm going for it. I've never been there. I've always been a middle of the pack kind of guy. I got a great life. I'm, I'm married. He doesn't have kids. They have a great life. Him and his wife travel a ton. Um, I'm going. I'm going to write it down. We always say, Mike, what's written is real. I'm writing it down. I'm going to be Top Gun. So I'm coaching him through the whole year. Now, the report comes out the third week of January after 1-1 comes through. And I see it on my phone. I'm at my brother-in-law's basketball game. I'll never forget this. And I pull it up on my phone. And he's the one guy right outside, number 24. Didn't make it. Oh. I mean, I take my client's success and failure personal. He didn't make it by this much, right? And it's based off a, a mathematical equation. So it was down to the tenths. So, you know, the fighting mind for me, I'm like, call the boss. There's got to be something else in there. There's no way, you know, and I, it didn't work out. So I let him kind of be for a couple of days because I know how salespeople are. You, you lose in that situation. You're beating yourself up. He's already analyzed himself for the last year. So I called him up, and he knows the whole thing about meaning, and I asked him. I said, Jeff, what does this mean to you? What's the choice you're going to make this mean? Because you choose. That's 40%. He goes, you know what I make it mean? It comes down to 15 minutes, Mike. Take it to the bank, write in a book, tell seminars, don't even care. The difference between being Top Gun and not Top Gun is 15 minutes in one year. I figured it out. So he was able to tell me five situations throughout the year where he could have sat, sat there for one more minute 
but he cut it short, didn't cross sell with a good question because he had a tea time on a Friday. He's got five clear in his head that he's got in his brain. And he's congruent, like he believes it. So I'm, I'm a number, I love numbers when it comes to stuff like that. So I wrote it down, I'm like, 365 days in a year, two and a, or if you take it, divide it back, 15 minutes, it basically comes down to 2.46 seconds per day. I round it up, two and a half. 2.46 seconds a day. That's the difference between you guys going to Portugal or not. Now, that may or may not be true, but why don't you go ahead and borrow my belief? Just borrow it for the year. So when you walk out of the office every day, just like I do now, because I ripped it off from Jeff, it's on my dry erase board. 2.46, the big circle and a red star next to it. Yeah, I have to walk by it every day before I leave my office in Scottsdale. And that 2.46 seconds, all I'm doing is asking one question. Who else could I call? Who else could I reach out to? I'm going to walk out the store, get in my car, on my commute. I have a choice. Am I going to listen to the sports radio or am I going to make that important phone call? I'm going to do a prospect call. Now, when I started telling this story years ago, I, I couldn't attribute it to a number. But because of this strategy, I've literally closed three deals. One was a speaking event and two were coaching clients. Because when I walked out, I asked the question, because I see it on the dry erase board, I went back to my computer, fired up my laptop, made that extra phone call that I wasn't going to do otherwise, and I closed the deal. I've got three of those that I can attribute it to. I won't, I won't tell you the number, but it's a good number. And my belief is, had I not had that reminder, I wouldn't have come back at 5.30 because my wife's texting me, come home with the kids. But I said, just one more thing. Just one more thing. I work with a lot of Olympic athletes in personal coaching, mostly track and field. That's where my niche is. Do you realize this? Four years. They have to train for four years for one event. Now, I think of my friend Susie Powell. She's the American record holder for the discus. She's from my hometown. I've coached her for years. If you've watched her, because I've been to the trials up in Oregon, the amount of time that she steps in the ring to the time the disc lands, she gets three throws. And I've done it. How much time do you think it takes to get in the ring, throw the discus, you know, it goes 200, 220 feet, 230 feet, whatever. How much time does you think it takes to do, throw it three times in real time? Yeah, it's about, it's, about a, it's about 45 seconds. So wait, wait, let me get this right. So you made a choice in your life to have a career that you're going to train for four years to do something that is going to be impacted for 45 seconds. And if you succeed or fail, you've got four more years to think about it. Yeah, that's Olympic athletes. And let me tell you, it's a tough crowd to be around. When my, when my guys or my gals don't make it, I give them their space. I give them their space. Because they have a lot of years to think about it, four years. Now think about it in your job. Oh, bummer, you lost a deal. <laughs> so what do you do tomorrow? You make some more calls. You, you, failure is only feedback in your world. There's no such thing as failure. You lost a deal, big deal. Learn from it, move on. Have a positive mental attitude. In their world, they got four and a half years to think about it. So I started studying it. And if you look at the London uh, Olympics that just happened, right? We got the new one coming up, 2012. 100 meter men's, very uh, vocal guy from Jamaica, won the gold medal. What's his name? Usain Bolt, right? You know who I'm talking about. He just crushed all the records, gold medal. He's the guy that's on the Wii's boxes, makes millions of dollars a year. Who took fourth place? I dare you to know this. Who knows this? This is an American guy. Who is it? No one knows. Tyson Gay. Fourth place, not on the medal stand, not on the Wheaties box. Got four years to think about it. What's the difference between first and fourth? Boom, 0.17. Here's 0.17, by the way. That's amazing. So when you hear this stuff, guys, it's, I'm not, this is not cliche. It's true. If you just ask one more question at the end of the day, if you just write one more thing down, make one more phone call, and you did it 365 times, I don't know how you can't stumble across a deal or a relationship or a connection or a referral. Am I right? You have a choice. You want to be here and you're here. Mind the gap. And that's a personal choice. Now, lastly, I want you to jot this down real quick. And I know you have your, little, uh, your cards too that Chico talked about. I see they're laying on the tables. It'd be great to use those. 
just write down three things. I, I gave you a, much, a, you know, a lot here in an you know, hour, 45 minutes, whatever it's been. Just identify three things. Now, I know you're a goal-setting culture, so I, I, some are not, by the way, which is, this is a beauty for me. I come in and know that you're teaching what's written is real. I mean, this is easy for me. So, I, but I want you to think about this. When it comes to goals, I'm not saying what, how much you're going to make, okay, or what's your revenue target or how much premium you're going to write. That's not what I'm asking you here. Like never before, I want you to think about three things that you're going to do this year. You're going to make a commitment that by the end of this year, you're going to do these three things. You've been talking about it, but you never really wrote it down. It's called a should. Americans are shooting on themselves. I said should. It's not a must. It's not a have to. It's a should. You know, I really should go to the gym. You know, I really should lose that weight. You know, Those people that are in my wedding, gosh, there was like five people that stood next to me in my wedding. And probably five of those guys I haven't even talked to in a year. You know, I probably should call my friend John. That's a big one, by the way. I know that one. Trust me, it affects me too. I had 10 guys next to me in my wedding nine years ago. And I, when I challenge myself and I'm honest and I confront the brutal facts, I don't feel as connected to them as I used to. To me, I know it's a two-way street, but it's on me. I have a choice. I can write that down. I'm going to write down John Guidi. I'm going to reach out to him. I know he's married. He's got two kids. He's been struggling with his business, and now he's doing great. I should just reach out and, and, and call him and just say, hey, John, how you doing? Like most people, they go, what's up, man? Haven't heard from you in a year. What, is something wrong? What, what do you got? You having a kid? I'm like, no, no, no. I'm just calling. They're waiting for the, the, the shoe to drop. Here's one for you. How many parents do we have in the room? Raise your hand. Great. I have a six and a three-year-old. Uh, Rhett is my oldest. He's in kindergarten. Six. Uh, Cole. It's three and a half. This is a rule. I, this is a rule of engagement I use because I borrowed it from my mentor. I have never, to this day, I'm proud to say this. I have never come into my house on my cell phone. Never. That was taught to me. He's my, my buddy. Goes. Can you imagine? You got your three-year-old. He's totally pumped to see you. You're his role model. He looks up to you literally and figuratively. And you're on a phone doing some big important deal and you're literally doing the Heisman to try to get him away from you. How embarrassing. What kind of father are you? That's what he said to me. I said, that's it, buddy. I'll, I promise you I'll never, I'll give you my word. It'll never happen. You ask my wife. I live in Scottsdale, Arizona. It's 117 degrees, usually on July 15th. And I'm in that cul-de-sac, sweating, trying to get off that phone call. And no, most of my clients know that. I go, hey, man, I'm walking in the door. Can I call you back in like a half hour? Because I don't want to be walking through the door talking on my cell phone. No, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not calling you out. I know half of you done it. My wife does it. I still call her out on it. That's just a personal thing. How about this one? A goal. Call somebody you know in your life, a friend, a family member, your kids, and tell them this one simple phrase that most people don't tell each other. Hey, man, I want to let you know uh, we've known each other for a long time. And uh, there's something I realized that I've never told you. I know you know it, but I've never said it. It's not I love you. It's not I'm proud of you. It's this. I got your back no matter what. I got your back no matter what. That's powerful. I, now, that was taught to me from mentors that, that learned in this kind of a program to communicate that stuff. It's a, it's a, it's a running ritual in my home. Every day when the kids that I put them in their